You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. You know, it's like, for me, I was, I was a Tom Petty fan. And yeah. when I went to his concert, I said, oh, like, there's a hundred more songs that I've always listened to. <laughs> you yeah. know, it isn't just the you know, full moon fever. Yeah. And this is what this guy represented for me. Yeah, like, well, my first exposure to him was the show Good Times. And, like, you know, getting into my, like, I wasn't, I wasn't watching the original run of the show, you know, obviously. But, like, it was one of those shows that came on at a random time. Like, like I'm going to say maybe, like, after school, when I was coming home from school, it would be on, like, UPN or something like that. And what drew me in was um, the artwork. I remember seeing like, because it was one of those things like flipping through the channels and I remember seeing um, JJ's paintings and I was like, at first it's like, oh, you know, sitcom guy's painting. But then it's like, that's actually kind of a cool painting. <laughs> um, and and then I, I found out it it wasn't, you know, it wasn't Jimmy Walker painting those things. It wasn't someone on set. It was um, an accomplished artist and our subject for today, Ernie Barnes. I feel like who Art Ed? Try to splice it. Who Art Ed? Mr. Wood, Art Ed, me. <laughs> yeah. Either way, it, it's a big, it works on so many levels. I know. That's awesome. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and joining me once again today, I've got my old friend, Chuck Hoff. Thanks for coming in. Uh, old friend is right. I'm, I'm 47, so thank you. I get older. Each time we I, do I'm, I'm yeah. right there with you, buddy. <laughs> T- time is hitting us both at the same, in the same measure. But, um, you know, I, I appreciate I appreciate you're like one of the only people willing to consistently keep giving up time for this. Um, oh no, this 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 is a pleasure. Number one, number two. Um, I I have to be honest. You know, again, seeing the artwork of today's featured artist, and then doing a deep dive. Um, it, I feel shame that we haven't used him more often. He is, he is one that, like, I, the more I look at him, the more fascinating he is to me. I mean, right off the bat, it's like, how many pro football pay, players were also accomplished painters? You know? I, I feel like we're, there's, there's a lost opportunity there to, to talk about arts in relation to, to sports. Um, and I guess, should we just get into a little bit of his biography? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, Ernie Barnes was born July 15, 1938, Durham, North Carolina. And, you know, this was the Jim Crow era. He he did not come from he did not come from the the greatest beginnings. Um, He lived in a part of town that was referred to as the bottom. I mean, that pretty much says it all right there in terms of what he was coming from. Jim Crow in the bottom in the South, you know, um, not a great, not a great circumstance for, for a black man to be born into. And it, and it struck me as I was doing, uh, some research, how there was a a definite ceiling above his head Oh And, and he had to figure out a way to navigate, um, and to play the rules in quotation. Yeah. That was through segregation, whether that was through, um, his interest in arts, like he was, he was uh, gently or, or nudged into areas, into the boxes that they wanted him in. He wasn't getting, you know, he wasn't qualifying for the best art academy. Yeah. And, and that's one of those things that I think, you know, in some ways there were, there were well-meaning people who helped him out it, where he was growing up. You know, his father was a shipping clerk. His mother oversaw the household of a lawyer. And I guess that lawyer, you know, was also on the school board locally. And he encouraged Barnes to explore art. And, you know, he listened to classical music. Like when when Ernie Barnes went to to work with his mother, um, you know, he would get to look through the art books and, and listen to classical music and indulge in and explore those interests. And I just, I find it so tragic to think, and this is not that long ago that 
you know, he could see, read about, understand, and appreciate those masterpieces in books, but he wasn't welcome to see them in the museum. You know? I, yeah, that struck me. Like, that, that's, that's one of those things when I, when I read that, it just, like, it just hits you. Because, like, as, as the teacher, I'm always, like, how can we give more opportunities to help our students discover something and nurture that, those interests? And, and just to think, like, how many people didn't have that in their lives. I mean, I, the glass half full, the man, you know, the man didn't let that stop him. You know, Ernie Barnes persisted. He explored his, his interests, and he continued pursuing things as society has made progress, um, you know, to open more doors for people. But that's one of those things I, I just remember reading and just, like, you know, it breaks my heart, just like how he described himself as unathletic, chubby, and bullied, you know, as a kid. It's like, ugh, I hate that someone had that self-image. Yes, yeah, self-image and then probably reinforced uh, by classmates. And then to think, you know, where the character comes in, to think where along this line would this have stopped? You know, um, I would I would love to see if he had you know, a memoir or a diary of just how impactful his mother was because she almost lived as long as he did. Yeah. And to think that it took, you know, I'm sure it took several people, a small community to keep lifting him up and to not get him into a singular track, which was for a little bit, the athletics. Well, um, yeah. And I'll go on. No, no. I'm just thinking like that success that, that, you know, when, things did lock in and he was able to go off to college on what we, we would see as a, as a full ride. Um, was it North Carolina state? Was that correct? Uh, it was North Carolina central university. Wow. And it was, it's a historically black college right across the street from his high school or something like that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm thinking how remote this seems anyway and how close it was. And, you know, from there he made the professional football league. Yeah. So to me, it's like he defied so many odds, uh, athletically, but then to have so many people care for him so deeply to keep encouraging his art through all of this. Yeah. And that's one of those things that I, I keep seeing coming up is like, you know, his parents supported him he, and, and encouraged him. Um, you know, like, like, like so many mothers, uh, his mom wanted him to stay close to home because I think he had offers for scholarships from a number of different universities. But she like she said, like, if you stay at home, I'll, I'll get you a car while you go to college, <laughs> you know, um, which like I, I think a lot of parents can probably relate to like okay how can I keep the kid close to me, um, but like throughout all all that you know there was the lawyer who his mom worked for like you don't have to take an interest in in your employees' kids he he gave him resources and encouraged him. Um, Barnes said that, you know, while he was bullied as a child, he would kind of keep to himself, go to the quiet corners of the campus and, you know, just sketch. And one day, you know, the weight, like one of the coaches kind of came, talked to him, like noticed him and, and took him under his wing, talked to him about how like weightlifting had and, and athletics had been so impactful for the coach and he wanted to help Barnes and, and, you know, it obviously was very helpful because, you know, by the end of his high school term, he was state champ and shot put and, you know, captain of the team. And that's what got him to college. And that is, that's a big deal. That really is impactful. And as you've already alluded, like from college, he went on to, to be a pro football player. He, he made it in the big leagues. So, um, you know, he did that for a few years and he was on multiple teams. But sticking with that theme of mentors, you know, in 1965, the owner of the New York Jets was impressed by, by Barnes's paintings. And he paid for Barnes to take a collection of his works out to New York. And unbeknownst to, to 
to Ernie Barnes, the the Jets owner, Sonny Werblin, probably got that wrong, but he arranged for some critics to, to meet them at the gallery and evaluate the work. They were also expressed like impressed by by his work. And so Sonny Werblin actually decided to keep Ernie Barnes as a salaried player. But instead of going out on the field, he was paid to go behind the canvas and paint. Like I, I don't know of anyone else in the history of professional sports who has been paid like because think about an athlete's salary. It's obviously pro football players then weren't making what they are today, but like it was a good amount of money, you know, to be a salaried football player painting. That's interesting. And it was, and it's interesting because, you know, every once in a while you have a thread of um, this reoccurring thing that the, you know, that the football player, for instance, is so much more than a football player, like an accomplished musician, Mm -hmm. an author or an artist. And when you see this, you understand why he had sponsors or he had mentors um, throughout his life because he was so, so much more than, um, you know, a gym rat or someone who would, you know, just spend endless, you know, in mindless time, you know, in a room just pumping iron. And so I just, yeah. I, I thought like, yeah, this is a likable character. Uh, he's featured on, you know, he would be featured on Disney plus, you know, this could easily wrap itself up to a, a beautiful story. Oh, and, that's a movie I'd watch. Oh, for sure. I mean, especially the tension he faced um, growing up in that era uh, where this, you know, wasn't accepted, um, that he wasn't accepted to blend in with um, all of the United States, you know, all of the population and their talent. Rather, you know, you're, you're going to be here, you're going to be over here, you're going to have a ceiling. Um, and then he just defied that. He just kept, you know, his passion lit. And, uh, and the artwork is amazing. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. He wasn't just like someone who could kind of play football and could kind of paint. Like he excelled in, in both fields that most people would consider to be very far apart. Um, and, and that in and of itself is, is inspiring and worthy of respect, but also to think about like, you know, he was an underdog who triumphed. And I, I always love a story like that. Um, you know, there's there's something really just inspiring about his personal narrative. But also, like I said, it's not just... I'm, I'm not looking at his work and grading it on a curve and thinking like, well, it, it's a good painting for a football player. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like... When I first came to appreciate Barnes's work, as I said, I it, it first struck me as something that was surprising flipping through the channels on my TV, but like his compositions caught my eye because they're very expressive, and in a way they remind me of one of my one of my old favorite expressionist painters, Max Beckman, in just his superb compositions and the way he activates every inch of the canvas. There's no dead space. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, no, that's right. And it's consistent. So it's an an express, you know, basically what he's done is he's put, and I'm looking at a few of his paintings here. He's put the expressive quality. If it's as as simple as springboard, which is, uh, you know, two, females um jumping on a springboard right yeah. your daughter it's it's both um characters both subjects are similar there's no inconsistencies there's no wasted space um and it is some people do this and it's it they don't pull it off well you know you you start it looks um it looks it, it bumps itself into folk art and you start to diminish uh, the skill level. You just say, well, they didn't get this right. We were just in an ice cream parlor with the family. And I looked on the walls and we just, honestly, it was so inconsistent between the subjects and the characters. I realized that the person just didn't have proportions and didn't have some of the, the basic elements of art to pull this off. Like this is yeah. done on purpose. This wasn't done because this is just the way he drew. 
he really wanted you to feel the characters. Like, yeah. They, he, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just saying, like, there's so much more personality in his paintings. You know, it left me a bit jealous. Um, back to, uh, 20 years ago, when I worked in my first job, I used um, his style to try to pull off uh, a really large mural. And I think where you get enough trouble is um, A, filling the space and B, being completely consistent to where um, you can get arms coming towards you and away from you, but you can still keep it looking elastic and expressive. Yeah, the um, I like, uh, there's so many things I like what you're saying there. Um, the consistency is difficult, especially like in Barnes's typical style, he's showing a lot of figures in motion. Um, and part of the characteristic style is these elongated, these elongated figures, um, you know, the longer arms and longer longer legs and, and things like that. And he has said that part of that was because of his experience as an athlete. And he was trained to pay attention to how his body felt. And he talked about how he felt like his body was stretching and elongating as he's at as he's at that peak of performance. And I feel like, you know, I, I am not a star athlete, but I remember how it felt to be sort of performing at my peak, like back in the day when I could run 20 miles. And I remember like my body felt different when it got into those peak zones. And when I look at when I look at his paintings of, you know, the basketball players or the football players, those athletes, it it feels like this authentic tapping into that feeling. You yeah. know, it's not what it really looked like. It's what it felt like. And as you said, it's really hard to do that consistently. And especially when you get to points like the arms come going forward, that foreshortening gets really complicated in this elongated style. That's right. And in, in, in the painting, I know we're a podcast and it would be worth um, the listener looking up. Well, do you want to pick out one specific one to go on? Because we could go on all day about yeah, like, it. Was, it was the American dream that I was referencing. But, American dream. Yeah. And, and I don't like, I think it was just to call on what you were talking about. The, the American dream, um, we're looking at lanes uh, one through nine, and we're at the Olympics. Yeah. And, and what he's done is he's thrusted the uh, winner, the, the main character, he's thrusted him in a position that, it, that if he stood still, if it's static, he falls flat on his face. But that's what invites you into the picture. You are invited to the first, to the winner, but then you're drawn around the circle, if you will, all of those athletes. And what's visible in the athletes here is we have, uh, I believe, seven athletes. So he's left out two. Seven athletes, seven lanes, nine lanes usually at the Olympics. And what you're looking at is you're, you're looking at each one of their uh, poses. And you can just easily imagine being any one of them. You know, from the last place finisher to the first place finisher, every one of them has something a little bit different with their poses. It would have been really easy to make them all lean forward. But the one in lane, I don't know, maybe three or four, lane four, he's in the back. He knows he's not going to win. So he just stretches those legs out, tries to get his best time. He's running through the, the finish line. Yeah. And to me, it's like magical. Like, and, and, he was very careful to remind people that he can paint and sketch well to proportion and do it, you know, accurately. Because if you look at the background, you look at all the judges, they're done completely in a static way to, to, to like almost to de-emphasize so you can stay right there with the action. Yeah. We see, you know, in here we see, and for for listeners, this is going to be linked in the show notes and, you know, tweeted out and on Instagram and everything. But we're focusing on, you know, the American Dream painting. And it is, you know, 
it is athletes running track right at the finish line. And we can see the, the athletes in the foreground are in that signature elongated style. But the middle ground is like the reporters, the photographers, and they do feel slightly active in their poses, you know, like they're, they're not like, they're not stationary, but they're not at peak performance. And so they are still in what I would call relatively natural proportion. And then the background, it's just like the blur of the crowd is just the, the specs, you know, it, it might as well be a Surratt, you know, it's just a bunch of dots representing the faces of, of the crowd off in the distance. But you're right. The poses, I think, create this really interesting action here because what we're, what we're capturing, as you said, we've got the winner, we've got the, the runners up, we've got the, the people who are in second, third place who were giving it their all and leaning forward and look like they're going to collapse over the finish line. And we've got the runner in the back who's running through it, just going for their personal best. You know, like they knew they weren't in contention. They're still doing, they're still like doing what they can, but there's an interesting tension there. Um, and I, like I said, the the feeling that those runners in like lane six, lane seven, they look like they're going to drop, you know, gravity, like that is an untenable position. Gravity will not support them leaned out that far, but they're going for it. Yeah. And it, you know, of course, as, as we're all reminded, first and seconds, deter- it's already been decided. So it's really, they don't understand. They see their peripheral vision. They know that, you know, uh, they're, they're looking for the bronze. And so that's where you get that tied up, you know, you get that feel that even yeah. though the, the main subject might be the winner, he really wanted you to look at uh, the, the fight for third place. And the guy in the back here, you know, as you're looking, he is the seventh man, let's say. He is really tense. Shoulders are up. He know he 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 knows he's lost. So he's he hasn't given up. He's just overstriding. And by yeah. this point, he has poor form because he's just doing everything he can, you know. And his dreams kind of slipped away. And for somehow, some way, he's captured all this. Now, if you look, like between the 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 character in the red jersey who took fourth, yeah. there are uh, between that character and the back character in the green jersey there's some celebration going on. So it's not just taking the pictures, but there's a few in the background too that are um, obviously his fans, you know, his teammates, uh, assistant coaches or whatever. Yeah. And so there's just so much going on here. That, and, it, you know, and I, I know that this um, may or may not have been his uh, masterpiece. Like when I look at it, it's, it's a sports related thing. So it... You know, socially, he's not tackle, tackling on something that would have been um, controversial. Um, this is kind of like in his wheelhouse. But I just felt that it was a good representation of the figures and, and the fact that he had to emphasize some parts of it, de-emphasize. And then there's a repetitive quality to this that he had to make abstract. So there's just a lot of uh, art elements to talk about here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, like probably his best known piece is, is the, the Sugar Shack piece because that was, that was featured on every episode of Good Times. That was on the cover of, I think, a Marvin Gaye album. Um, it was like, it was part of his series, um, you know, back in the 1960s, 1970s, there was the Black is Beautiful social movement, and he created a series of paintings um, trying to find, like, and portray beauty of the ghetto. And, you know, that and his athletic works, um, like his works about athleticism, are what he's best known for. And, you know, he really became famous for being one of the best painters of athletics. And I think this, you know, while it may not be 
the iconic one that like is the first painting that everybody thinks of when they think of Ernie Barnes, if they're aware of his body of work. I think this is really a good representation of what he did masterfully. So I appreciate that you picked this one out. I was going to go with, I was going to go with one of his basketball ones for similar reasons, because you're seeing the figures in motion and you're seeing the range of sort of emotions of those different athletes. Um, We see the pose of the winner is this just so transcendent. You know, it it looks like they are going to sprout wings and fly off of that track, you know? And I, and I, and I want to say like, you know, from, um, you know, the, the, something that I've kind of thought about, like he had some success as a football player and he broke through a ceiling. He was accepted to a degree. And yet like he captures in sugar shack, he, he captures a moment of complete freedom and bliss encased in this house, you know, and with authentic signs, you know, a Norman Rockwell, Without this, without it being so staticky, you know, without having static uh, poses. Yeah, it, it's it's an active Norman Rockwell, and right. and and what I would say, what I like about Barnes compared to Rockwell is not just that it's more active, but there's there's greater diversity to it. And I don't just mean like, you know, the, the obvious, like these athletes are different, you know, racial, ethnic backgrounds. There's that, that superficial diversity, but there's just like, there's the diverse emotions. There are these poses that oh so like subtly, subtly convey vastly different experiences for every single individual who's there. Well, okay, so that's ex- that's a great way as we frame this, you know, episode. That's a great way to say things because in our world today, our youth today, they will be told, you know, and pictured n- most of the time, ninety nine percent of the time, in a very static pose, a Norman Rockwell scene, you know, if you will, um, Thanksgiving. You know, we had just seen that scene, right? And 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 this isn't that. This is um, some of these poses would embarrass today's youth. Like, please yeah. don't post me dancing. You know, please don't. You know, and 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 so I think that's where the electric, you know, super electric, and it's super authentic, and it's super candid. And and I feel like this is the replacement for um, a photo. You know, it's it's anonymous enough. You know, I don't see a character that I recognize, and yet um, you can insert yourself. And yeah, I, I was embarrassed at this. You know, at this dance, uh, at at a wedding reception. This is me, right, or whatever. Yeah, I feel like that that comparison is is really strong. Um, you know, Barnes versus Rockwell is the difference between your formal family portrait in in the studio compared to, you know, the candid shot of the party with your friends. You know, I, I almost always do that, and I know you will as well. Is where you get. Um, I had this on my winter trip where we all stood. And there's seven of us and we stood on our skis and then it was the goofy pose. So you have the, like the straight yeah. out, like make sure this one gets on Instagram or Facebook. And I just leaned over and we fell candidly and we were all on top of each other with skis flying everywhere and the poles. And I went from Norman Rockwell to Ernie Barnes within three seconds. And, yeah. and honestly, I kind of liked the Barnes perspective i you know i i'm always one who is more for the candid than the staged correct you know um i i've always been the type who's drawn more towards what feels like the authentic expression and like i say what what i love about this is there's true range there um you know, when compared to a Rockwell, like Rockwell was good at what he did, but it was always from his specific lens and what he wanted to to highlight and feature and the, the nostalgia and, and all that. Nothing, nothing against that, but 
in in Barnes's work, we have we have a whole range of things happening, and you as the viewer get to sort of select what aspects are you looking at and responding to and connecting to, you know, I can relate to that feeling of the, the, the excitement of, of winning. And you feel like you are like going up, like you're walking on air and I can relate to that agony of defeat and the collapse at the finish line as you gave it everything you have and left nothing on the field. And I can I can relate to that feeling of being the runner up like I I knew I wasn't going to win this but I want to finish strong and I'm I'm doing all I can there. Like there's just there's that full range of things for me to see and appreciate and I can I can hone in on what I want instead of like instead of the artist selecting what's that's the right. mood. No, that's right. And then you know also with the 300 magazine covers that uh, Rockwell did, you know, you sometimes frame the characters in a very rigid way where you triangulate, you try to find yeah. the, the interest. And, and Barnes just didn't always do that. And he made his linear. You have to look from left to right and you better pay attention because there's a lot going on. And, and, and to his credit, because, you know, I'm looking at a, a church celebration and to his credit, he didn't take any shortcuts. You know, just like he was self-made to become the state champ or to become a shot put champion, he kind of did that in his artwork. He just went all out to all different corners of the painting so that you can study it and, and be interested in it for years. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And like I said from the beginning, um, you know, he reminds me of, you know, Max Beckman in that respect with just like the every inch of the canvas being active and engaged. And the composition is just, you know, I, I feel like it's masterful because there's so much going on without it being overwhelming. And I'm wrapping it up. I want just a three point rating scale. And where should this hang? The Lou? Is this something to look at? The lab? the lab? Is this something to learn from? Or the loop. British for the bathroom. Yeah. There's, there's a the loop joke in there somewhere. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. It belongs front and center. I mean, it belongs. You know, I've, I have an athletics uh, background, but I wouldn't tap his painting. Like you said, the Sugar Shack um, is just as interesting. So it's not like he was, he was not a, trying to appease a certain audience. He, he masterfully appeased all of us. And so uh, he'd go front and center in my most important room. And he'd be a collection of, I, I think he'd be a collection because of the depth of his character. Yeah. I can see him being among my top 15, you know, paintings on a wall. Yeah. So, so you're, I think we're in agreement. This feels like a museum piece. This is one to, to go right prominently hung in the gallery. Cause this is one like, you know, his work, it's beautiful to look at, but there's just there's there's always more to to see and relate to and connect to, and you know, like I say, I, I always I always find it interesting. It's a it's a unique perspective. A professional athlete who was also an accomplished painter. Because, you know, we always think of, you know, the joke is the artists are always bad at sports. But, you know, because he had that experience, he brought a unique lens to the creation of works with figures in motion. And, and I, 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 thought of, like, I thought of like historically too, like just a couple artists like the Goya piece, you know, or the, or Guernica. You know, I, I just thought I was trying to figure out where to place the movement and i just realized that um s some of the artists that i think of touched on it he, yeah i see a goya a little bit yeah. there yeah but i see a deep dive like i just see him just being able to hone into what he was like this is a a true depiction of what he wanted to be and it's unwavering it you know it's a consistency throughout all of his paintings and that's probably what i appreciated most yeah, it, it it is a strong body of work. He's certainly not like a one-hit wonder. Um, 
you know, like everything, everything I've seen by him, it's just like, yep, that's pretty good. Cause yep. you know how some artists you're like, you, you know, you got the famous piece and it was like, you know, when you look beyond the scream, it's like, Oh, what did Monk do? You know, <laughs> like, no, for sure. And, and the I made four of them. Yeah. Well, the consistency, you know, is there with, with, uh, with some of the, artists that stick in the back of your mind where you're like, I call them up often. It isn't just because of the influence of how it was taught, but it's just something that stuck with me contemporary and the ones who have passed. But now that you've introduced me to him, Ernie Barnes will kind of stay in my crawl. Oh, definitely. Totally appreciate that. Uh, Well, thank you for taking the time to join me on this. Talk about uh, Ernie Barnes, one of the, the greatest real artists creating work for a fictional artist. <laughs> I, um, I look forward to uh, doing this almost each and every week. I, I just really enjoyed this. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted? If you found this tolerable, please like and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week in the show notes on Twitter at WoodArtEd and the website whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.